Oh my, I remember 1974 is when the Lord called us to uh, Shady Grove in Grand Prairie. And that was um, in March, March the 10th. I'll never forget that day. It's interesting how God moves, and I don't know if, if I don't know if I'll preach or what. It's just, it's interesting in how God moves in us, because I, I, I when I when I surrendered to the ministry, I I thought what my heart was, God, I want you to do something, rather than me do it. Somehow, if I could help you and assist you in any way possible, then that's what I want to do. And I don't want to take any of the glory for it whatsoever. My dad was a vocational. Um, he worked and he pe preached at the same time, worked for Montgomery Ward, and um, was also a preacher by vocational. And uh, he's, he went to churches out in the country around Abilene that were without a pastor, small churches, and he'd go and pastor them, sort of see things come back together and they would grow some. Then he ended up starting two Baptist churches in Abilene, one on the east side and one on the west side. And um, so I was in, in, in church and I saw a lot of the work of man and, I, and not, I'm not talking about my dad, because my dad, was, he, he really sought the Lord in what he was sharing. But um, when I surrendered my life to the ministry, I knew that I didn't want to be somebody that everybody knew. I would be too, I thought if I'd be too tempted to take the glory and take the praise for it. I didn't, I didn't want that. I want to see God move. And I mean from the bottom of my heart, that's what I've always wanted. And um, so I remember the day that God spoke to my heart that I would be coming to uh, Grand Prairie. But he didn't say it that way. Let me just tell you a story. I, you mind if I give you some testimony? Then I, wanna, I, I know what I want to end with. I think I do. But um, we'd, been, we'd been at... Uh, at First Baptist Church, Johnson City, for about two years, and I had gone out to visit with a couple of uh, with a couple. They had four children, and she had visited the church with two of the children. And I drove out there. It was, you ever heard of Church's Fried Chicken? They had they had thousands of acres uh, where they would bring people in. Their the people they wanted to. Uh, get closer to and they'd hunt deer and things like that and so it was like t close to five miles from their gate to the house so I drove to the house and that day I led uh, the husband son and one of the daughters knew the Lord but she renewed her faith in the Lord and then the two that had come to church and um, I was so happy I'd led them to the Lord I was driving out there, and the Lord stopped and said, said, see that hill right there? And it was December the 11th, and it, was a, it wasn't cold, but it was cool. It was crisp, and it was in the af late afternoon. And I said, yeah. I, he said, stop the car and come up and meet with me. And, and I've left a note in case one of the ranch hands saw the car there and thought maybe I'd break down, had broken down. I put the note on the windshield that everything's okay. I've gone to the top of the hill. And um, I got up on top. It was amazing. They had cleared out the very top of it for hay gazer, grazer, so that for the deer to come up and eat. And they left three little trees right out in the very center. And I didn't, I'd never been there. I'd, it was my first time even on the ranch. So I got up there and I took my Bible and, and I walked over to those trees and I just sat down and said, God, I'm, I'm, here to, I'm here to meet with you. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, said there will be a, a, 
a committee that will come to, to, to the church, and they will ask you to come and to pastor a church. It'll be in a large city area. didn't tell me anything about names or anything. In a large city area. And, um, and it, will, it will have to do with mobile homes and I'll, I'll get some other things like that. And then he, then he said, but I, I want you to walk as, as, a, as a Levite. And I want you to, and I didn't even know what in the world is he talking about. But all I knew was he said, you're, you're going to move. So I, I, while I was there, I, I started praying. And I said, God, I want all that you have for me. And, and I could sense the wind, a wind blowing through me. It was like I heard the word clean through me. And I, have, I was changed from that moment on. And I got to the house, to the parsonage, and walked in. And I said, well, so get ready. We're going to move. And she, oh, boy. Well, she, she loved it in Johnson City. She loved it there. And I said, we're, we're going we're gonna to move. She said, no, I'm not going to move. <laughs> I, like, I like the schools, and I like where we have the kids and all of this stuff. No, we're not going to move. And I said, well, okay. This is what the Lord told me. And, and there's going to be a, pul a pulpit committee come. Usually, Baptist pulpit committees always have one token woman on them. Any of you ever been Baptist? You know, and the committee comes, and they have one token woman. So I said, well, Lord, when you send the right... Uh, committee. I never had had a, a committee to come and listen to me. And they just show up without letting you know. And uh, I said, Would, if it's the committee you want me to go to the church to answer yes to them, then let there not be a lady. Just, just, just no, I don't want anything against women. It would have, I, it would have been easier for me to, have, harder for me to have said, uh, let no men come and all women because there's always just one woman. And I thought, well, it'd be easy, and a woman comes. So that morning, sh the lady was got sick, and they called on the youth pastor to come with them, five guys. And I thought, uh-oh, this, this, this has got to be something to listen to. Nonetheless, I ended up going to Shady Grove. And mobile homes, Sybil thought we were going to live in a mobile home. I thought we were going to live in a mobile home, too. Not that that's anything wrong with it, but we'd been accustomed to living in houses. Well, we did live in a mobile home our first marriage, first part of our marriage, our first marriage, our first part of our marriage. And so, um, so we were driving around the area where the church was, and all of a sudden we turned on Beltline Road and Irving and Grand Prairie and nothing but mobile home park after mobile home park. And there are five mobile home owners in the church, members of the church, who owned five mobile home parks. So everything just came together. We ended up, we ended up there. And uh, God just continued to bless and, and give us indication that he was going to do something. And we were running about 85 people at, at the time. So God just began to move, and if we, if you, I know if you want Him to do something, that He will do it. If you want Him to do it, and if you're willing to step back and say, "Lord, I'll represent you, but I want you to do it," uh, He will. And one of the first things that I discovered that God wanted was our love, our love for Him, and our love for one another. And so I, I heard that from the Lord and began to press in, press into him and concerning that. And in prayer, I'm talking about. And, um, and God just began to pour out love in, in the church. Uh, one night, one night when, whenever I got through preaching, it was like the Holy Spirit fell. There's no answer, no other answer to it. The Holy Spirit fell. And people started coming up to the altar and weeping and crying. I thought, what, what is going on? And someone said, said uh, forgiveness, forgiveness. I, I forgive, I forgive. But this was, and then they started going to one another. And two women in this, in this small church had not talked with, to one another in how many years? 
in 20 years. And they got up and went to each other and asked one another for forgiveness. And man, the Holy Spirit just broke out in that little Baptist church. It was just, it was, it was just absolutely amazing, 85, 85 people there. And those kind of things just begin to happen. And it's, it, we didn't make it happen. I just kept crying out to the Lord, God, would you do something? And, and he said, the first thing I want to do, I want to pour out love for me and love for one another. And that's exactly, that's exactly the way, the route we went. And, we, and in loving him, we begin to, uh, God began to open our hearts to worship, to like what we were doing earlier. But it was like, I wasn't satisfied with just two or three people worshiping. So we begin to look at what, are, what were some of, the, one of, some of the, the, the ways we worship the Lord. How, how do it like raising hands, like, like singing and things like that. And, and we begin to we investigate all of that. And people begin to do it. I, c I couldn't believe it. We began to do it. And I remember the first time, we, and everyone was singing, because here's, here's what I told them, and, and God really encouraged me to tell them this. He said, when you were young, your mother w loved your singing. It may not have been very good, but she loved it. And I remember my mother making me sing. <laughs> she made me on Christmas sing Silent Night, and she recorded it. We we'll put it on one of those old wax records, you know, and she recorded it. I, she played that every Christmas. She would play that every Christmas. And it embarrassed me so much because my little voice was breaking, and I'd say, Silent Night. And, and my mother loved it. <laughs> Why? Because I was... I was her child. God loves your voice. Doesn't matter what the person next to you thinks. So they, they, so they begin to do this. See, they begin to do it. They begin to, then we begin to sing. And so, <laughs> and I said, God, it would be so good. I, I would, it would just be exciting. If, if one, one song that, that whenever they got through singing it, they were so excited, they'd just start clapping and no one would say to clap. No one would encourage it. Wouldn't preach on it, nothing. Just spontaneously. Let them be so excited about your presence in, in the house that they just start clapping. Do you know what? It happened. Her mother and daddy happened to be their Baptist couple. And they were sort of shocked about it. I was a little shocked about it myself. And, and they sang and got through it. And they just, everyone just started clapping all at one time. I thought, that is really cool because it shows something that's happening in the hearts of the people. That was what so exciting to me. And it just began to grow and begin to grow and begin to grow. And then, then there would be words that would begin to come in a meeting that would say, um, that it would come to me because we didn't know how to handle it. Someone said, I feel like that there's someone here that's, that their right leg has been about to fall off. And they've fallen on it. And I, I see there a bruise on their leg. Uh, would you say something about it? Yeah, at the right time. And they'd go back and sit down. The right time I'd say, uh, Mr. So whatever had a word that someone had this leg. I'd tell about it. Who is that? I didn't say, are you here? I said, who is that? And the, boom, the hand went up. Really? Hey, you, would you two guys next to him, or ladies next to him, would you lay hands on him and pray for him right now? They'd say, do what? I know. Well, just pray. You don't have to lay hands on him. Just pray for him right there, right there. And we began to see things like that begin to break out in the, in the church. And it began to be, when, when we'd come together, it would be the presence of God, such a love for him, that was just unbelievable. You know, I'm, I'm not going to turn to Scripture. I don't, I don't feel like I should right now. But remember, um, um, is it the, was it the Philadelphia church, the church of where he, they got um, talked to by the Lord about for concerning their lack of love and... and 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 they, what church was that? 
Ephesian church. Oh, my goodness, yes. The, the church at Ephesus. And, and they had lost their first love. Well, uh, what, what could they do? Repent? But they quit being, he said, I'll, t I'll take the, the, your candle. I'll put your candles out. And that didn't mean they wouldn't be a church anymore. It would mean they would lose their influence. It would mean that the moving of the Holy Spirit wasn't the same because they had quit loving him. As a, as a group, maybe there'd been something crossing over it with, you know, with one another, aggravated with each other and things like that. But, but nonetheless, it had, it had stopped. And what God was saying, don't, don't ever, if you sense the Holy Spirit not moving, would you just have, bring a, a, a word or, or would you encourage people just to love the Lord and don't lose that love. Just keep that heart burning for the Lord and burning for his presence. Oh, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it is the most amazing thing to be in a church where everyone loves one another and everyone loves the Lord. It doesn't mean we get together, get all get alone together all the time, but it does mean we get it worked out really quick and 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 people continue to love each other. So so I'm telling you, I'm telling you that presence of God. If I if I had to, if I was going to start a church all over again, that's what I would do again. The same thing I did before. I would just keep putting in in the hands of the Lord and saying, God, uh, would you work in in our lives, and would you bring about a love for you. And to the to the extent that we will express that love biblically in a biblical way that uh, where there, your anointing would come and people would begin to be healed and that's exactly that's exactly what happened so we never had a service at Shady Grove after that where um, the same things would happen in, in services it we never knew what to expect whenever would come in. Robert Morris came in, he was there 17 years, and he started off uh, just uh, cleaning our school, our, our school building some, and then he became a deacon and then an elder in the church, and he was there 17 years before he started Gateway. And so that's, he raised up in that, in that same thing, but he is more of an evangelist and his evangelist heart just says, let's really ask for the presence of God, but let's don't do things that would cause people to, to be turned off, you know, from it. And they're, they're, they're seeing thousands and thousands of people get saved. It is a, it's an amazing thing that's happening, happening there. So what, uh, what I, what I want to do is to read something to you that... I was I was praying this afternoon about um, this congregation. I don't know where this came from. It was in a notebook that I have laying on the bed in a motel room. And um, I said, Sybil, have you ever seen this? She said, no. I said, I haven't either. But it's it's typed out. And I was praying. I had my head on the bed my knees on the floor, and my notebook was over there closed, and I was praying for a word for this congregation. And I looked at my notebook, pulled it over, opened it up, and this was down the side sleeve, just like that. Never had read it before. I read it to Sybil. I just, I, I got tears in my eyes just reading this. I want, I want to read this to this, this, to this congregation. May this place... May this be a place where sinners find their Savior, and the prodigal is welcomed by you, a generous and compassionate Father. In other words, is welcomed here by a generous and compassionate Father. May this, play, may this be a place your saints, young and old, are encouraged in the gospel, equipped for service, sanctified in the truth, and joyously assured of the eternal redemption Jesus has earned for us where the wounded receive comfort for their souls and the weary are revived. The despairing are filled with hope 
and the depressed filled with joy and the sick are healed. Where your fathers seek and find worshipers and wor who worship him in spirit and truth. And Jesus, our head, receives honor and praise. His cross is boasted in, the power of the resurrection lived in, and his second coming hoped for. May the Spirit of God and the he heavenly dove find a friendly place to land and to dwell in this church. That, that is one of the sweetest things I think I've heard. Just really, really sweet. Um, there is a passage of scripture. Oh, let me let me read this to you. I've got one more thing to do, and then I want to I want to do a message here, Mona. Here it is. When I was pastor of First Baptist Church in Johnson City, Texas, where we were talking about 1973, I had a dream. I wrote it down on paper. After we got cell phones, I put it on our computers. I put it on the computer, unchanged. And I had a disturbing dream. I can't explain how the symbols, what the, how the symbols I saw were translated into the words of knowledge that I was hearing. But I saw the church in the United States like a river split into three streams: heresy, apostasy, both split off, and left the central main stream which would be the people whose hearts were after God, these two groups began to spin inward as they, sp as they spun off of the branch that was flowing. And the third branch was this people who hungered at, for truth and authenticity with a great hunger for reality. Overall, this appears to be a weakening of the church at a time when the culture of our nation was radically transforming our government into an anti-Christ, into an anti-Christian machine. The structure of our country was being dissolved. I'm talking about in the dream. In the dream, the culture of our country was being dissolved. Freedom dissolved into lawlessness with gangs of people going up and down streets, destroying things considered by them to be symbols of people and businesses financially well off. Then the citizens began to cry out for order to be restored, which resulted in an attempted coup that ended with a totalitarian type of government in order to restore our nation to its roots. The president was a man of good intentions. Then I noticed that the third stream of the church had been growing in boldness and power and authority. Some people in the, in the split off groups returned from the heresy and the apostasy branches and they returned and joined in. This return added to the already growing third branch and became a powerful movement of God's manifest presence, a tremendous move of God like the nation had never seen unfolded. And I wrote this paper on the day following the dream in the spring of 1973. I had no idea. I thought it was, I told my wife uh, the next, that morning, I said, I, this, this thing uh, I think is going to happen in about three months. And and I'd, I'd finally just given up on it. And when all of this stuff started, oh, and I saw, I I skipped over it, I saw these police uh, in helmets. I saw them, I thought it, they were soldiers. Because back then, policemen didn't wear helmets. Uh, they just wore caps, you know, the way we used to dress. Now then, we, they, they, we have helmets. That's not unusual at all. But back then, it was unusual, and I thought the army was out on the streets when all of this was taking place in, in my dream. But it was, it was not the army, it was the police. Now then, I'm seeing the very same things happen. But here's the reason that I wanted to tell you about it. I wanted to tell you about it because it ends with a mighty move of God. It's a, it's a strong move of the Lord. It's going to happen. Whatever we see is happening right now, do not let it burden you down. Trust God in this whole thing, because we're going to this the move of this move of God is going to come out of this. M most of the time in our own personal lives, when we go through a testing tri time, we come out of it better than we were before we went in it. And oftentimes we'll look back at it and say, "Man, that that, that was good for me. I thought it was so bad, but it was good." And I, I believe that we're going to come out of this thing in a great move of God. It's not just going to be in the United States. There's going to be a global move of the Lord. The Lord told me um, in 1998, 
I was in, in, a, in a, a prayer meeting. I'm in a, a, a meeting a, at a large hotel, about 1,000 people. Sybil was there. And I got called out. This was the fall of 98. I got called out, and this lady prophet from, um, from Canada, her name was Tracy Campbell, and, um, uh, and she spoke over me, didn't know me, and she said, like Simeon, who went to the temple, he was an old man, he went to the temple and prayed because it had been revealed to him by the Spirit that he would not die until he would see, till he would see the consolation of Israel, until he would see baby Jesus and be able to dedicate baby Jesus and hold baby Jesus in his arms. And the Lord has revealed to me that you're going to live until, and, until you get to hold the next major global revival in your arms, so to speak, that it has been revealed by the Spirit that you won't die until you've seen this global move of God. Well, since then, since then, I had a quadruple bypass <laughs> four months later. <laughs> and, and then when I was coming out of the, the drugs that they'd given me, before I'd even opened my eyes, the Lord said, you remember what Stacy Campbell, what Stacy Campbell said to you? That, and he repeated the exact words to me. And he said, that's the reason I've kept you alive. And so, and so just one thing after another, it looks like, uh-oh, I, I had to have the artery opened up in my neck and things like that. But you know what? I'm still here. I'm still healthy. I still walk two miles a day. And my doctors are, are amazed. I'm 82 years old. I'm going to continue to live until I see what God said I would see, a move of God. But we have this move of God coming, brothers and sisters. So just get ready for it because we're in a period of time when we need it. I've never read anything like I have, like I read in the book of Jude. So if you wouldn't mind turning there, I'm just going to read three or four verses uh, from the book of Jude. Um, Jude, do you know who Jude was? He was James's brother, and they were both half-brothers of Jesus. And it is believed that they didn't come to know the Lord as their Savior until after his resurrection. And so James became the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, and, and uh, Jude just kind of, he, he did a lot of good work, missions work, started a church or two, they say, but here he is writing to the people. And uh, he's concerned about something. In verse 3, um, he says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning your common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Now, it, it, he, he's telling the church. Now, he, he comes out of a Jewish background. And, um, and he's now uh, overseeing and ministering to churches all over, the, all, all over the land at that time. And he was writing to them and said, look, you've got to contend for the faith. We can't just sit back. We contend for it. That means we work for it. We move toward that for the faith. And it said, for certain men, in verse 4, for certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and Lord Jesus Christ. These people were infiltrators. Somehow they made it into the church. And do you know what he said was wrong with them right there? What, what they were doing? They were taking the grace of God and said, because you have grace, you can just do whatever you want to do. And they got into lewdness because they said the grace would, grace would cover everything. Well, grace does cover everything except what, what we, if we just rebel and intentionally use it as an excuse to go ahead and sin and do whatever we wanted to do, then that grace, that's not great. They're not even in faith. So that, that's not, they're not covered whatsoever. But we are. I mean, if I am, if I do something... Thank God for the grace of, 
of, of God. Thank God that he saved me out of, out of my sin. Thank God for that grace. But we can't use that grace as an instrument to do whatever we want. And that's what the church was doing that he was writing to. In fact, I think it was several churches that he was writing to, an, an open letter who turned the grace of God. Look at verse number uh, I've got to read five, and then he'll put six up on the board. But I wanted, in verse five, I want to remind you, though, you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved forever. He has them reserved for lasting change until darkness from the judgment of that great day. You see, one of the things that we're going through in our nation right now is, is not just human. It is spiritual that we're going through right now. There is a demonic force. There is a, there is a battle that has been going on for the world. And when that battle started was when, it, when, when Adam and Eve, when God created Adam and Eve, and he grew, raised them up in order to multiply and to cover the face of the earth. Multiply. Go out, multiply. And, and, and that's what they were to do. They could have done that. They would have done that. But what happened to, to them is because of their own will, they decided that they would listen to Satan rather than listening to God. Satan came and tempted, tempted them. And when they fell, guess what? That was broken. The commission, I call it the creation commission, to take over the world. Adam and Eve were to take over the whole world. They were to multiply and multiply and to see that the whole world would become like Eden. That's actually what he was wanting them to do, to I, I, Edenize the world. <laughs> they, Eden, the whole world would be like that. And if they had have done that of their own free will, see, God gave them free will. God won't make us do anything. But when, when by their own free will they violated what God wanted, then God had to begin to search out another line in, in, the human, in, in human beings, a, a whole new line, and he found Abraham. Now, we know the rest of the story. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and right on up the, uh, yeah, what do you call that? The, anyway. <laughs> lineage? Lineage? Come, lineage. What, lineage is a good word. That'll, that'll work. But right on up the lineage until we, come, um, until we come to Joseph and Mary and Jesus and Jesus, and they all had their own free will. They walked with God in their own free will. They didn't turn away from him. It didn't mean they were perfect, but they didn't turn away from him. They wanted to do what God wanted them to do. And then Jesus came of his own free will, walked through, gave his life, shed his blood for the sins of all mankind of his own free will. And out of that, we were born. We were born out of that. We're born again. We're, what are we born again for? We're born again for the creation, to reach the creation, the creation commission, that we are to do the same thing that Adam and Eve were supposed to do, and we're supposed to take over the nations of the world in the sense of leading everyone to the grace of God, leading everyone to the grace of God. That is a little stream, just a little stream of, of what of what God has, has been doing. Now then, here we are. And there are people in other lands. Do, do you realize, let me, i got to walk around a minute. Do, do you realize that in Deuteronomy chapter 32, it sh says that God actually set, set demonic fallen powers over other nations. In Deuteronomy 32, they were the powers that the same the same. Gods, the sons of God, which was, which was not actually sons of God, but they were Elohim gods. They were multiple gods, and and so there were there, oh, there's only one Yahweh. There's only one uh, glorious God, King of all and Lord of all, and 
never will be another, and there's none as powerful as he is, and on and on. He, he is God. But these other they're angels, a third of them, fell with Lucifer. And that third, some of those thirds mixed with, with women in Genesis chapter 6. And they created these hybrid beings. They were known as giants. And it's what, it's, what it talks about in Genesis. They were known as giants. And I'm just ru running th this through to you really quick to say, say look, what, what is going on right now? Who is driving the car right now? Well, God is the one that's in control, and we know that it's going to turn out the way God wants it to turn out, but it's going to turn out by people who are committed to Him of their own free will. No one makes them do it. And we, we, want, we want to love God with all of our heart. We want to see other people love God. We know that it makes life worth living. This other is nothing but a waste. But these, these demonic spirits that, that God has placed over other countries they're the fallen, fallen spirits. You know, do you know that you can go? I hope I'm not just jumping around everywhere. And my wife's probably looking at me thinking, where are you going? I don't know where I'm going, baby. I just don't know. <laughs> Look, but, but do you know the, these, these fallen spirits are in different nations? And you can change nations. We can, if you, how many of you have been to another country, foreign country? Is, is the atmosphere the same as it is here? No, no, no. And and you can go from you can go from Kenya Kenya to Angola and there's, there's a difference. You can you can go from Texas to to New York and there's a difference. No, honestly, in the in in the spiritual there is a difference, right? You sense that. What is, what is that? There 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 is there is a spiritual war that is going on. And I personally believe this. This is I think this is what God told me. The devil thought this was the moment. And he hit, it, hit every nation. But honestly, I'm not saying this out of pride, but there is no nation like the United States. Most all the other nations are some form of socialism. Not us yet. It doesn't matter which way, which way it goes. I don't want it to go that way. And don't believe in that. I'm not believing that it will. But if if that kind of a that's the kind of a war that is going on now, because this nation was founded for the purpose of being a Christian nation. I mean, our our constitution says that it's it's it is based upon on Jewish Christian beliefs, right out of the Word of God. And, and there, there's, what other nation is like that? There's not. God in, was intending for this nation to be a nation of revival that would break out. But what has happened to us? What has happened to us? The same thing that, that, that Jude was talking about, all kinds of lewdness. I mean, people do, with, with, people with, with animals and people with, with same sex and people with everything else and whatever, on and on. I, I, we, we love those people. We've got to love those people. And we're not against them, but I am telling you what, God is not for them. He can't be living like that. And they're just living for themselves. They're living for the, for the joy of it. They're what they get out of it. And all of this, that's the, I know what, my son has been there. My son has gotten free from it. Thank God, he's been free for, what, five years, Sybil? Going on six, six years. Been free six years. And he's really, he's really seeking after the Lord and doing, doing great. He's going to be a voice, I believe, to his generation. And he's 50-something years, 58, 58 years old. And he believes right now that he's going to be a voice to his generation and he can go back into that group of people and, and can, can turn them, turn them around I believe, bring revival there. But what I am saying right now is the devil thinks he's got a hold on it and he thinks that if he can just get America, he's already working it in these other nations. These other nations were hit with this same virus 
and, th and we're hit with it, but he's wanting to break us. That's what the enemy wants to do, to break us so that we just give up and say, okay, so let's just do it. That's not going to happen. That is not in God's plan. God's plan is that he's going to use people like us to, be, to, be, to, to love him more and, and to, and to believe, begin to believe for the power of God. Yeah. See, in, in, uh, in, I believe it's uh, Matthew 26 or 25 where it says this. This message of the kingdom of God will be preached in all the nations, and then the end will come. The message of what? The kingdom of God. Now, that message of the kingdom of God is not just to get people saved. Do you know Jesus? Oh, yeah, then you're saved, and that's the kingdom of God. No, it's not. The kingdom of God is power and life and deliverance. Jesus said to the disciples, He's, when he sent them, the 12 disciples, he sent them out into the villages. And that said, he said to them, you go and preach the kingdom of God. Declare the kingdom of God and heal the sick and cast out demons. Amen. That's kingdom of God. Go declare the kingdom of God, heal the sick and cast out demons. And he told the 70 the very same thing. You go into the village, you, you heal the sick, and you cast out demons. Isn't that right? So what he said. When that gospel of the kingdom is preached in the nations, when the power of Jesus Christ is released through us, and I believe through this nation, going to be released through this nation, it's, they're going to fall like dominoes globally. And we're going to see the greatest move of God that we've ever seen in, your, in our life. There will be people that we, in the gutter that, that are get, going to get saved. There's going to be all what we would call perverts that are going to get saved. There's going to be people who are thieves and murderers and everything else. They're going to get saved, going to get born again. The power of God is going to come into their lives. And this is what is go we're going to see in the future. We're going to see this happen. It may happen sooner than we expect. It's already beginning to happen in some parts of the United States. There's huge groups of millennials, particularly. Thank God for millennials, and let's receive them. Let's get them in. I want more millennials. Come on in. Come on. Come on. We will let you, we will let you learn the ways of God, and we will, let, we will let you be leaders in the house of the Lord. We will let you oversee the house of the Lord. We'll let you pastor other churches one of these days and everything else. Come on in, millennials. I mean, that's what we, that's what we did with us it, that, at Shady Grove. We, when these people started coming in, these younger people, and right now they're leaders all over the world out of, out of Shady Grove because we accepted those people back in the Jesus days. We accepted them. Now we've got the millennial days, and we have a responsibility to get them and to save, see them get saved and to train them up and lead them lead make leaders out of them so that they can turn around and reach the rest of them. You got, y'all know what I'm saying? I believe that that's what God is doing. Now, if you want to know prophetically, I, I would, I would just, I bet, I start to say I bet everything I have. I don't mean betting that way. I, I promise you, I, it's just, just like that message came from 1973. It's just now happening. I didn't make that thing happen. Sybil knows when I got it. I, I talked to her the next morning. We were getting ready to move to, to the big city and get in the midst of all of that was going to happen. But it hadn't happened. But it is now. Yes. The very same thing. But what comes at the end of the dream, what comes at the end of the dream is that there's going to be a, a stream. Those that fell away those who are in heresy, some of them are coming back in in the stream. And it's going to be a big, big move of God. And God is going to establish someone who can put order back in this house. Back in, the, back in this, I say this house, I mean this nation. To put order back in this nation. Um, I, want to I want to leave you with this one thing. And not, not leave you. I want to I want to pray over some of you. I've got I've got a word or two. But this is this is something I think is necessary. 
What do we do? And look in, in verse 20 of Jude. I'm back to Jude. Boy, I went a long way off route, didn't I? Okay. That, that, that was all. That's all free. <laughs> but you, verse, verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. Isn't it interesting? It's called them beloved. Oh, beloved. Build yourself up in your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Whoa. What do we do? We build ourselves up in our holy faith. How? Praying in the, in the Holy Spirit. And keep yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Two things. Two things that he says to do. Number one, well, build your, build your Self up in your faith. How? Praying in the Spirit, Holy Spirit, and by keeping in love with Jesus. That sounds simple, doesn't it? And you know, for some reason, and and I didn't I did not read I have not read that passage in a long time. Just reading through the Bible, you know how you read over over verses of Scripture and they don't necessarily impact you at that moment. I. This one had not impacted me until yesterday when I was reading it. And when it said, in, in praying in the Holy Spirit, building yourself up by praying in, in the Spirit and loving Jesus, keeping your love strong for Him. Strong. I don't know about you, but have any of you, if you pray in, if you pray in the spirit, your prayer language, um, how many of you, how many of you would say, how many of this? Is what I want to know, how many of you would say it has seemed to increase recently? See here, something's happening. Something is happening. And if Christians would begin to turn and and begin to pray in the spirit a prayer language that we don't understand what would happen let, let me read you one more verse may I one verse turn to Romans 8 I've got a brand new Bible here. Look at verse 26. Um, we've got to read 25. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows that the mind of the spirit, what the spirit of the mind, the, what the mind of the spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I, I've noticed that me, my praying with understanding gets is getting more limited and more limited. Praying in the spirit. I want to pray on, on and on and on and on. My prayer time, early morning prayer time, praying for my, my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren has turned more into tongues, more into praying in the Spirit. Just praying and praying. And then I'll get a name and I'll say, I'll say, uh, Landon, and then I'll start praying. And I know I'm praying for Landon. You know, Paul, the apostle, said uh, we have to be careful where we pray in tongues because people won't understand us, you know. 
But he did say, he did say this, that, that you can, when you pray in the Spirit, he was talking about mealtime. So apparently some people then would say, hey, would you give thanks? And they'd just bow over it and, 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 and start praying in tongues, giving thanks. And he said, well, no, wait, they don't understand what you're saying. It's not doing them any good. It's not edifying them. But he turns right around and says, even though praying in the Spirit is good, but they can't understand you. But God understands you. You see, it's his language. And he understands. And he prays, he prays for things that we don't even understand. I, I, just, I flat run out of words to pray for my kids. You try praying for, for 23 kids in, in the morning. I've got an hour and a half, and I've tried to pray. I can't even get to all 23 of them an hour and a half. But I guarantee you what, I can begin to pray in tongues. And I've only started doing this in the last three months like this. And I just begin to pray over them. And man, we're seeing all kinds of results. God knows what is needed. He, know, he knows what the will, what the, his will is for them. Not me. And, and I pray that way. I believe that God is going to raise up a church in this hour that is going to pray in the Spirit. I'm not, I talk, I'm not talking about walking into grocery stores and praying in the Spirit. And I, I'm not talking about... You know, making a big scene out of it. I'm talking about in our prayer times, praying in the Spirit. Go on, an hour. I can do it two hours. We can pray it three hours. Whatever God is speaking to your heart and praying in, 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 in the Spirit, letting the Holy Spirit speak those things that needs to be spoken. His Spirit is doing that. So I'm, I'm saying to you, my brothers and sisters, I know this is, for some people of some denominations, this is a hard language. I mean, a hard thing to say about tongues. But I'm telling you, you'll begin to see results like you've never seen before. And it keeps us in love with Him. It really does. And it builds up our faith. And if we had the Christians in this nation praying, like that I believe we would see this thing turn around just like that because this is a spiritual battle these people are motivated by demonic spirits anytime they can um, support uh, the murder of babies even at birth just kill them it, God's not pleased with that. But when we pray in the Spirit, I believe we're going to have more power than we've ever had in our lives. We, the church I'm talking about.